Thank you to Elizabeth and to Jane for organizing all of this and for being a, a great matchmaker. Um, the topic of this conference is just very near and dear to my heart, as you'll see from my research, so I'm just thrilled to be here. So ever since I was a little kid, I was kind of obsessed with the relationship between representations, the stories that we tell ourselves and one another, and reality, real, lived life. I lived in a very small town in Eastern Oregon, and I ended up living my life quite vicariously, I'd say, through books and popular music, and through a lot, a hell of a lot, of television. I was obsessed with TV guides. I collected them. I annotated them with Nielsen ratings that I gleaned from the local newspaper. Any surprise that I became a media researcher? No. Um, and I think what was driving me is that I felt like if I knew what stories people enjoyed, what they were really passionate about, the decisions that people were making about what they would watch at 8 p.m. on a Thursday, that I would know something truly substantial about the world, about that world that stretched far beyond the city limits of my very small hometown, where I felt completely off the grid. Even when I went to college, I became even more confirmed in this belief that if you knew something about people's taste and their preferences, you knew perhaps the most important thing about them. So fast forward to my life now as a media researcher, surprise, surprise, I'm sure my mother isn't surprised. She had to clean out all those TV guides from under my bed. Um, and I do research at the Norman Lear Center, which is a think tank at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California. And one of our main goals is to do solid academic research in order to understand the, the impact of entertainment and media on our lives. Now when we talk about engagement, a term that gets thrown around a lot when you talk about marketing, uh, especially in the media business, really we're acknowledging that overlap between representations, aesthetics, and storytelling, and effects on real people in real life, right? We're expecting that somebody is going to spend real time, real money, or expend true emotional energy from their real lives on something that's instigated by a media representation. Now, one of the research projects at the Lear Center that I have found most exciting that I've worked on over the years sort of tackles exactly this nexus of issues. We decided to find out whether we could sort of scientifically study whether there was some correlation between your entertainment preferences, things that you enjoyed doing in your free time, and your political values and your ideological beliefs. Now, if you talk to any survey researcher, they will probably tell you that it's not all that productive to ask people to label themselves politically. In the US, the result you often get is people say, well, I'm moderate, I'm not crazy, and everybody else is extreme, right? So that's not all that helpful. So what we did is we created a diagnostic tool. We circulated dozens of very highly charged uh, political statements um, to our survey respondents. It was an American national representative sample survey that we did a series of times. And these questions or statements that we asked people to agree with or disagree with, however passionately, had to do with all of the topics that make people in the United States absolutely bonkers, right? Abortion, the environment, uh, questions of equality and gun rights. And then what we did is something called K-cluster analysis. We did a statistical analysis of the responses of the respondents to find out whether certain groups of people tended to respond to these statements in the same way. So we didn't know if there would be 20 groups or 15 groups or nine groups or two, but it turned out that there were three very coherent groups. And we had to come up with labels that describe these groups. And so we ended up calling about a quarter of the population moderate in their uh, beliefs in terms of an ideological spectrum. Uh, about a third were liberal, and the rest uh, fell into a conservative category. The rest of the survey was composed of hundreds of questions about entertainment preferences, 
What TV shows do you like? What blockbuster films did you watch last summer? What musical genres do you enjoy? What live events do you like to go to? And we wanted to find out whether each one of these ideological groups had some sort of coherent entertainment profile as well. And we found out that they did. So among conservatives, the largest group, they had very specific sort of television viewing habits. Um, in terms of playing games, they liked Monopoly. We weren't surprised to find that in, in terms of news, they preferred Fox News. They said that in their leisure time, their favorite thing to do was reading books, or reading, I think it was more generally. And in terms of live events that they preferred, they were usually sporting events, and they were big fans of NASCAR. Now, liberals, it turned out, you were more likely to find in a, a concert venue or a theater rather than a sporting stadium. It turned out that they preferred Trivial Pursuit. They liked Super Mario. They were big fans of Wikipedia, which conservatives were quite skeptical of. Liberals said that their main leisure time activity that they enjoyed was surfing the web. They liked Jon Stewart, no surprise there. And their favorite TV show among the top high-rated TV shows uh, in the nation at that time was 60 Minutes, which is absolutely despised by conservatives. <laughs> Moderates had a completely different profile, and this was a very uh, interesting group to us because so many political campaigns are trying to figure out who these people are. These are often swing voters. Um, they were the only group who were willing to admit that they really like reality programming. So, so I think actually they're the most honest group in the sample. Uh, they like Scrabble. Uh, they like Dance Dance Revolution. <laughs> it's very sweet. Um, and they watch a lot of TV, and they actually said that their number one leisure activity um, if they had to choose one, would be watching television. And that was borne out by our data. They watched a lot of TV. So I was kind of disturbed by these results, you know? I was hoping to find some cultural touchstones that bring us together as a country, bridging these political divides. And instead, I found out that basically, these people don't even play the same board games, right? So it was a, it was a little distressing. Um, we asked about hundreds of different uh, uh, entertainment preferences and entertainment properties, and there were very few that were equally beloved across these ideological divides, but they included the TV show House, which was for many years the number one show in the world, over a billion viewers uh, of each episode a year, a billion. Uh, football, yeah, everybody loves football in the United States, and rock and roll. So those were the things that brought us together. When we asked about genres, just generally, you know, do you like action adventure? Do you like educational programming? It was as if we were asking them to divvy up the genres, right? There was hardly any overlap among these ideological groups in terms of their genre preferences. The, the only overlap was that moderates and liberals were more likely to say that they enjoy drama and educational programming. That was it. Now, I can't possibly go beyond this slide without delving a little bit more deeply into the documentary preferences. Um, and just to be clear, right, if you're a documentary lover, it does not mean you are necessarily a liberal. It just meant that our data said that if you are a documentary level lover, it's more likely that you would fall into the liberal ideological group. But here's a, a sort of drill down into what those preferences looked like in the survey. What we did is we compared people who said that they really, really, really enjoy documentaries with people who said they really, really, really hate documentaries and figured out what the biggest differences were between them in terms of demographics and politics and other entertainment preferences. So the top three biggest differences between these two groups actually had to do with taste. One was that documentary lovers also love educational programming, they love nature and science programming, and they dig arts programming too. Those things are just not beloved <laughs> among people who do not like documentaries. 
They also liked drama better as a genre. They liked comedy better as a genre. So these are people who really enjoy uh, entertainment genres overall. They're less picky in a way. We had asked the questions about musical genres, as I mentioned before. And so it was very interesting to see that there was a distinctive difference between documentary haters, let's just call them that, <laughs> and documentary lovers who were also big lovers of blues music. They also were big fans of baseball. That was the only sport where you could sort of predict that this person might very well like documentary film. Now the next finding is an interesting one. I have to test it out on you guys because it didn't fall within the framework for the liberal ideological group. Um, if you were dropped off in a bookstore right now and you had the choice to go to a section that was nonfiction genres opposed to fiction genres, I'm going to ask you which section you would most likely go to. So how many of you people here would go to a fiction genre section? So fantasy or romance or literary fiction? Okay. Now how many of you would immediately beeline for nonfiction? Okay, yeah, that's what we found. <laughs> so it was interesting because uh, when we were looking at the ideological split um, in terms of bookstore preferences, we found that conservatives tended to gravitate toward entertainment forms and book uh, genres that were more uh, connected to reality, right? They liked books about business, they liked books about sports, they liked books about history, and they didn't like the fictional stuff so much. So it was very interesting to find that this reverse preference was here among documentary lovers. But of course, it, it makes sense. You guys actually get a kick out of reality. <laughs> you escape to reality, right? When you're having a good time. Um, <laughs> crazy people. Yeah, one of our other findings was that documentary lovers actually enjoy entertainment that has political themes. Surprise, surprise, people who don't like documentaries don't like entertainment with political themes. Now, you may have noticed absolutely no demographic variables showed up so far. And I was listing them in the order of their statistical significance. Um, the one demographic distinction between these two groups and I wouldn't even call it demographic, but classically it's included in that section, is that documentary lovers were less likely to say that they were born again Christians. <laughs> so that's my message in this chapel today. <laughs> Reflect upon yourselves and your sins. <laughs> So when we went back to the ideological clusters, conservative, moderate, liberal, uh, we checked to see what were the demographic characteristics, obviously, of these three different groups. And our statistician told us that what she found were blurred matrices, right? That she could not predict inclusion in any of these ideological groups based upon your demographic profile. And we had a very extensive demographic profile. So knowing someone's demographics did not help anyone predict whether they were conservative or liberal or moderate, but if you knew their entertainment preferences, if you knew what they watched on TV, what genres they liked, you could probably make an accurate prediction. Now this of course is right back to the topic of engagement, right? Because if you are trying to use a story to engage people, in something that's actually real and happening in the real world and asking them to make some sort of effort or to do something in the real world that's triggered by that story, then it's probably going to help you a lot more to know about your audience's taste rather than knowing anything about their demographics. You could spend a fortune on a demographic campaign and you might not succeed as well as if you knew more about what books they like to read. I think this is particularly the case with documentary because you are even more clearly than in other art forms exploiting this overlap between representations, stories, aesthetics, and real lived life, real problems in the world. And so if you're hoping to sort of find that key spot in that Venn diagram between political beliefs and aesthetics and taste, this is probably the best way to do it. Now I think a company that is taking that idea to the bank is Netflix, right? Their algorithm is all about understanding their audience's taste. 
that is their value as a company. And they got a lot of media exposure when they decided to start going into original programming. House of Cards, they agreed to spend a hundred million bucks, you know, right up top. And it was partly because they were able to go through their data about the taste of their audience, right? They could see exactly how many people seemed to love Kevin Spacey, how many people watched David Fincher films, and they even had data on who had watched and rated highly the BBC original miniseries called House of Cards. So they knew exactly how big their prime audience would be. So their investment was not that much of a gamble. I think a lot of people felt that the investment in Orange is the New Black was much more of a gamble. You didn't have a big director name, you didn't have a big star. It was a very quirky idea that had been rejected at Showtime and at HBO. But what they could do was check their taste information about their 40 million members, their audience data, and they found that indeed there was an underserved audience there that liked black comedies, that wanted a female ensemble multicultural show, that wanted an appealing female lead, liked lesbian storylines, and uh, really enjoyed uh, uh, filmed entertainment and television entertainment that was set in prisons. <laughs> oh yeah. So you can imagine when Genji Cohen pitched this show to them, they went, oh, yeah, that works. <laughs> There's a lot of people who would watch this. So this is the kind of show that would never get greenlit, you know, at a broadcast network in the United States. In, in my lifetime, that would never have happened. But they were able to do it here and feel pretty confident that people would view it. And they made one other really sort of uh, uh, gutsy decision. They didn't do any marketing. With House of Cards, they bought the billboards, they spent a fortune on a traditional marketing campaign. With Orange is the New Black, they sat back and they just tested their recommendation algorithm. They wanted to see if it would just be recommended in people's queues and whether people would pick up on it. And it turned out that Orange is the New Black actually had more views in its first week than House of Cards. So for documentary makers and people in this industry, I think this is amazing news. Of course, I am as resentful as probably everyone else is about how Netflix hoards their data and doesn't share it. If I could sneak in, I would. <laughs> but the fact that they've developed this algorithm that is optimized to find niche audiences is just a godsend, I'd say, to documentary filmmakers who are always trying to seek those, those very specific audiences who have exactly the right kind of mindset to latch onto an idea that a documentary is presenting. And now that we've heard that Netflix is going to start expending a lot more resources on acquiring and also developing original documentary programming, I think that's a sign that they too understand that a documentary is a wonderful space for a company that takes taste profiles of audiences very seriously. Now at the Norman Lear Center, a key part of our mission is to try to understand the impact of media and entertainment on the world. And so all this research that we've done about taste and politics really helped provide a solid sort of uh, research data foundation for our belief that entertainment and media plays a very powerful role in people's lives. And it's one reason that we have been partnering now for 14 years with the Centers for Disease Control. This is the big, 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 big public health agency in the United States. They found out through their annual surveys that over half of Americans believe that the health storylines that they see in primetime television, entertainment programming, and daytime soaps they believe that that medical information has been vetted by somebody and that it's accurate. This is over half of Americans. Over a quarter said that this was one of their main sources for health information. So the CDC got very concerned. <laughs> and they set up a partnership, a cooperative partnership agreement with us, because they're in Atlanta, they don't know how these Hollywood people think. 
We're in Hollywood, we have very good connections there, and so they work through us to try to encourage these shows to include accurate health information and to do research to figure out whether it was having an impact on audiences. So I'll just mention a few of the reports. There, you probably have like 46 academic publications up on our website right now. One example is that uh, the, the number of calls to an, a national HIV hotline uh, went off the charts when The Bold and the Beautiful aired a storyline that we consulted on in which this guy tells his girlfriend that he's HIV positive. <laughs> That's one way to get a lot of people to call an HIV hotline, especially women who often do not call these hotlines. Um, we found that viewers of an episode of the TV show Numbers said that they were more likely to volunteer to donate their organs after a storyline in which Rob Morrow, by the end of the episode, agrees to put the organ donation sticker on his card. So people actually were moved to change their minds about donating their organs after they saw a fictional TV episode about this. Now in our surveys, we often ask questions about what kind of actions have you taken based on entertainment programming? Not news programming, not documentaries, entertainment programming. And we find that 65% of Americans have admitted that they've taken some kind of action. And 13% actually said that they wrote a check to somebody, to a charity, based on a fictional storyline in a TV show or a film. Now we do have studies where we know that stories have actually saved people's lives. There was a massive study in Tanzania where a radio uh, soap opera that had a big HIV thing was broadcast to only certain provinces in the country and it was blocked in others so that they would have a control group. And they saw that HIV rates were plummeted in the portions of the country where this very compelling radio soap opera was playing and that HIV rates just kept going up in the provinces where it was not being broadcast. They actually had to discontinue the experiment for ethical reasons. And eventually the entire country got the radio broadcast and the HIV, HIV rates started to plummet. Now usually we don't have the luxury of this kind of government control of media where we can do a kind of a clinical study in order to see whether exposure leads to these very important outcomes. But we wanted to figure out a way to do that. At the Lear Center, we wanted to figure out whether there was a way that we could take media as seriously as a pharmaceutical company takes a drug, right? We want to know what kind of media is most effective with what kinds of outcomes, what delivery mechanisms work the best, what kinds of allergic responses my audiences have to certain kinds of media. This was our goal. So we started working with participant media. You probably all know the production company. They've done all these wonderful films about social issues, both uh, narrative films and documentary films. And their goal with each and every one of them, to one degree or another, is some kind of social change. They're hoping that people, they will affect the world somehow through this storytelling. So they wanted to work with us to see whether we could come up with a smart way of evaluating the impact of their films. And we started by honing in on the documentary film Food Inc. This was our pilot study for a brand new methodology that would try to take into account the biggest problem with media impact research, which is self-selection bias. It has to do with taste, right? People don't just watch anything. It's not easy to get a national representative sampling of people to watch a niche documentary film like this because we gravitate toward things that we're already interested in. And so when we're trying to evaluate the impact of that piece of media, the main argument that will always come back to you is that, well, that audience was self-selected. They were already predisposed to accept that message. So how do you get around that? So it's a certain kind of person who's interested in seeing a film like this. I always say this isn't exactly a date movie, right? 
So there's a certain subset of people who are going to see a film like this, and uh, this is a representation of uh, what that distribution looks like in the United States with the, the richer, deeper colors, I'm sure you've already ascertained, uh, representing you know, the, the higher numbers of, of viewers of this film. So if you were to do a standard sort of representative sampling of the American population in order to try to make some claims about the impact of this film, which was an incredibly successful film, but still, it would cost a fortune to actually get enough viewers across the ideological spectrum and the demographic spectrum in order to make those claims. So we wanted to try something new. So what we did is we came up with a survey instrument that we administered to both people who had seen the film and who had not seen the film. And we wanted to distribute it in the cheapest way possible so that we could create a model for you know, indie filmmakers who would want to do this in the future. So we did it through participant media's various online networks. The questions in the survey are, as you would probably imagine, we had demographic questions. We had questions about how interested they were in the topics in the film. And most importantly, we asked people whether they saw the film or not, whether they had taken certain actions that were recommended in the film. Our first task was to create a model using statistics and a lot of math to figure out what factors increased the likelihood that somebody would see a film like Food, Inc. It didn't matter if they had seen it or not just whether these factors would contribute to likelihood that you would see it. And we came up with 17 statistically significant variables, and many of them were just very intuitive. These were people who had already been interested in food safety. They were concerned about agribusiness. Uh, they had followed news stories on various platforms about this topic. They were lovers of, of social issue narrative films and documentary films. They had seen Fast Food Nation, for instance, which covers some of the same territory. They believed that films could have some sort of impact on society and on individuals. And once again, there were 17 factors, and only three of them actually were related to demographics. So age, race, income, uh, geography, none of those things actually predicted whether you would see Food, Inc. or not. The three demographic factors included sort of surprising ones, that there was a likelihood that you did not work in the media industry, <laughs> that perhaps you worked in education, that would increase the likelihood that you would see this film, and that you didn't have any kids which was a huge surprise to the marketing team at Participant. They assumed that their prime audience for a movie about food safety was paranoid parents, right, who didn't want to poison their kids. So we came up with this model, and we applied it to every person who had responded to our survey. We had 20,000 respondents to our survey. And we didn't pay anybody for a survey panel. This was just through social media networks. And what we did is we applied this model to every single person who took the survey, and we gave them a score that would describe their likelihood of seeing the film Food, Inc. So there's the person who hates documentaries, doesn't care about food safety. They get a really, really low score. And then there are the people who've been obsessed with this issue their entire lives, and they always see participant media films. They get a high score. What we did is we compared the person who had exactly the same score and we did this one-to-one -one with every single person, we compare the person who saw the film and who didn't and see if they're taking different kinds of actions so that we could ascribe that um, accountability to the film itself. So it turned out we saw huge differences between very similar people who had seen the film versus people who had not seen it. One of the more obvious uh, findings was that people who saw the film were more knowledgeable about the issues that were discussed and explained in the film, like gen genetically modified corn. These people tended to know more compared to people with the exact same score who hadn't seen the film, maybe because it's still in their Netflix queue. These people were more likely to encourage friends and family and colleagues to learn more about food safety. They were shopping at their local farmers markets more often than their doppelganger who hadn't seen the film. And they were actually eating healthier food. So these were huge behavioral outcomes that we were able to ascribe to a documentary film. 
And one thing I have to tell you is that we didn't obviously administer this survey to people as they were walking out of the theater. We administered it one year after theatrical release. So these messages had to be sort of deeply embedded, and it also represented a year's worth of reflection and thought about that film, not just a knee-jerk reaction as you walk out of a theater. Now, our real goal here in this research project had been to do an evaluation of waiting for Superman. Uh, Food Inc. was just our pilot. We were testing this methodology. We weren't sure if it was going to work. It worked great. So we couldn't wait to apply it to an entirely different documentary film on an entirely different set of issues. How many people here have seen Waiting for Superman? Okay, a fewer number. So, so I'll only, this is the first time actually that we've publicly announced any of the results from the Waiting for Superman evaluation, but eventually we will issue a, a full report. Um, but we structured it very much in the same way that we did the Food Inc. research. We needed to establish, identify which variables influenced someone's likelihood to watch Waiting for Superman so that we could create this control group again and compare people who had seen it to very similar people who had not seen it to see whether there are different outcomes in terms of knowledge and behavior. In terms of knowledge, we found once again that the film was very effective at increasing knowledge levels among people who had seen the film. We asked a range of quiz questions from really easy stuff to actually very hard questions. And people who saw the film uh, were far more likely to get all of those questions correct. And once again, we administered this survey one year after theatrical release. So it was not as people were walking out of a theater. Now, there was a huge social action campaign that was built around this film, and there were very specific outcomes that they were hoping for from this film. And it turned out when we did the uh, propensity score matching analysis that people who had seen the film were more likely to take these four actions out of the six that were proposed by the social action campaign. Um, and we were especially excited, I must say, by the increase in likelihood that people would be donating books and classroom materials to schools and that they might be volunteering or mentoring students. We often kind of know on a gut level that of course people talk about a film that they've seen, they might seek more information, but these kinds of actions are, are really quite moving and, and can have a, an obvious social impact. Now, one thing that we didn't do in Food Inc., and we wanted to make sure that we did in this survey, was to figure out what happened in terms of people who had been activists, socially engaged in these issues long before they saw the film, and then what happened to them after they saw it. So in Food Inc., we didn't account for that. If you had been an agribusiness activist you know, 10 years ago, did that make a difference in terms of outcomes? So what we did here is we asked people whether they had been taking these kinds of actions 10 years ago or five years ago, and then we checked to see whether if these people had seen the film, was it more likely that they were taking those actions now, and which ones? And it turned out that we saw exactly the same pattern of action pickups, so the film was particularly good at inciting people to take these kinds of actions. And we were able to prove that people who had been involved in education in the past were less likely to be involved now if they hadn't seen the film. Now, I found this a very, very important finding because I think a lot of documentary filmmakers are chastised for speaking to the choir, right? That, oh, you're just making a film for people who already agree with everything you say. And of course, there's limitations to that model. But this research demonstrated that it can be very important and productive to speak to that choir because those people who want to take social action, who are interested in seeing you know, informative documentaries, want to take action in their community, they have many, many, many choices for how they can direct their energy and money and efforts. And a film like this can redirect people back to the issue that you're most interested in. So my message to you is that don't ignore the choir. You may want to proselytize and bring in new people to the tent, but these people are incredibly important to you and to the movement as well. Obviously, 
uh, the Waiting for Superman social action team was also very interested in how this film affected parents who saw it. So these were the four uh, hoped for outcomes for the social action campaign. And we found that people who saw the film compared to very similar parents who had not seen the film were more likely to be doing these three things. This includes reading to your children 30 minutes a day. This is a very sort of gratifying outcome for people who have made a documentary film about education. Now one thing I really love about the survey methodology is yes, it's incredibly wonky, but it doesn't get in the way of the filmmaker at all. We don't come in until a year after the film has been released theatrically in order to figure out what sort of impact it had on society. I think a lot of filmmakers are anxious that if they open themselves up to an impact evaluation, they're going to have these people hanging around over their shoulders trying to frame shots for them, trying to reverse engineer an artistic product into something utilitarian, something that's serving a social purpose. But it doesn't have to operate like that. We can come in much later and provide some very scientific evidence about the way in which your artful engagement with audiences actually worked, and we can measure it for you. Now, I know that a lot of filmmakers are kind of frustrated with the degree to which they have to develop these very complex online social engagement strategies, right? You gotta have your Vimeo channel and your YouTube channel and your Facebook page and your Twitter account. Some people enjoy this aspect, of engaging with their audience, but I know a lot of you feel that it's just a hell of a lot of hard work. Well, I see it as a godsend, because for researchers like me, this gives us a very cheap and easy way to reach a lot of people who were exposed to your film. I hate to tell you, but it's much easier to find people who haven't seen your film <laughs> than finding people who have. So this offers a cheap, easy way for us to do that. And uh, we need that data in order to do this kind of evaluation. So these two research projects, three research projects that I've described have really led to an entirely new uh, program at the Norman Lear Center, which we're calling the Media Impact Project. And we're working very closely in partnership with the Gates Foundation and the Knight Foundation which together are really taking the lead in the states in trying to bring all the foundations together who fund media and sort of up their game, make, it, uh, uh, make these foundations a little more accountable to society in terms of the media that they fund, and to provide tools to media makers who have a mission to measure media engagement and media impact in the most accurate, insightful, and scientific way. So we collect best practices, we convene constituencies. We just launched this program last year. And uh, it's been very exciting to see the interest, both in the for-profit commercial sector, among government agencies, and also obviously among nonprofits who always felt like, that stuff's too expensive for me, I don't have the resources to do it. One initiative that has emerged from the Media Impact Project that I, I just wanted to make sure you guys knew about it because it's so applicable to the work that you're doing is something we're calling Sea Change. And what it is is a curriculum that brings together all of the best sort of academic research and, uh, and information from filmmakers on the ground that connects the dots between storytelling, engagement, activism that emerges from that, and the social change that you might be hoping to accomplish through your filmmaking. So thank you so much for your attention today. I want to thank my completely adorable team. Look at this. Doesn't this look like headshots? They're so beautiful. Uh, for helping me with this presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, and if you could speak up, and I will try to summarize very quickly your question as well. Okay, I have two questions. I'll try to be concise. One, um, did anybody else notice that uh, the um, I am going to be active mode did not 
ever include going to one's political bodies, be they, you know, your local politician. It, it just says so much about dissatisfaction and cynicism. The second is, um, I've been currently commissioned by my university to create a, a sort of docu-instructional video, and they keep insisting on pre-post evaluations and change on behavior, but no one is coughing up a template. Do you have these for the likes of us? Do I May have I have one, one now? <laughs> How to design pre and post impact surveys. Right. Um, well, this method of survey research actually is a replacement for pre-post. Okay. Because the people who are in the control group are basically pre. Yes. And the people who are in the exposed group are basically post. Yes. And some people still prefer pre-post research, but many people actually prefer this mode because it has one timestamp. One of the big problems with pre-post is that you ask people a series of questions in a survey, then they see the media, and then you ask the same questions again. The problem is that you've primed them. By asking the questions before they saw the media, they framed their experience of the media with those questions in mind. It's kind of hard not to do that. And they're reflecting on the questions that were asked of them. And so they've been primed to think about those topics in a way that with our survey, since it's administered only once, you're not primed. And how would one gain access for templates that would help us um, design effective surveys? Well, that is the purpose of this media impact project. This kind of survey research methodology is not easy. I've had a very difficult time finding people who have the math skills to actually do this work. This is not something that you can just download off the internet and do at home. So that is the problem with it, but the good side is that it's very inexpensive to do, and the whole purpose of our Media Impact Project is to build up enough resources to be able to help people to do it and to do it for you. Um, but I want to get back to your original question because that was very, I'm so glad that you noticed that, that the, at, the calls to action with both of these films that had to do with engaging with political representation and political process tended to be the actions that people did not take. And we have noticed this as a pattern across our research for a few years now. And one thing that was quite a surprise to us is that people who tended to be very willing to engage in a social action campaign after seeing a film did not necessarily think of themselves as political people. They were very unlikely to donate to political causes. They often had no political affiliation. And they often weren't even registered to vote. So it is, so it is our suspicion that people who might be particularly primed to uptake action messages from media uh, that is promoting social change are people who have deliberately opted out of the political system and the political process. It's not uniformly the case for all, but this seems to be a trend that we see in the data. Any other questions? Yes. I have a question about um, the, the level of impact a film can have. Um, and I'm wondering, I assume that there's a kind of cascade effect after so many people see a film, it impacts more and more people because it, you know, it, it ricochets and, and bounces off. I'm, I'm wondering if you looked at the, the number of um, people who saw the film and, and had a measure of, like, was there a threshold that you had to reach before it, it started to have more impact? And if it fell below that, it had, you know, it, it didn't really register? Well, you're talking about a, a larger sort of social impact, which is much harder to measure than impact on individuals. So we tried to focus on the low-hanging fruit. You know, with survey research, you can ask people, individual by individual, what sorts of changes have you made? Are there changes in your attitudes? What do you feel that you can do in the future? There's all kinds of questions that you can ask. Figuring out how that adds up to a tipping point to social change is a much more 
more complicated research project, a much more expensive research project, and it's one that we hope we're going to try to make affordable and easier to do through our Media Impact Project, which also includes building a huge data analytics center where we can integrate the survey research that's sort of individual by individual with very complex web metrics, information from social media networks, so that we can sort of triangulate and figure out exactly if there is some sort of tipping point at which individual behavior change turns into a larger community change, national change, or something that looks like a global movement. That's just a much trickier proposition. Yes, in the back. Oh, yeah, no, it was... Yeah? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, there we go. Hi, my name is Joanne Fishburne, and I'm an independent uh, impact producer based here in Toronto. I'd be very curious to know whether you've compared um, data from films that have had um, impact campaigns associated with them and films which have had none at all. No, we haven't had a chance to do that, but I can't wait. <laughs> it's a little easier for us to develop a survey instrument if there was a social action campaign, because we can basically say, uh, what did you think you accomplished? <laughs> what were you hoping to accomplish? And then we'll figure out whether that was the case. Um, one thing that we discovered with the Food Inc. campaign is that people who had worked on it um, and who gave us information for the survey said, well, here's an item that wasn't in our social action campaign, but we're pretty sure sure that this is something that occurred. It had to do with obesity, I believe. And so we included that in the survey, and it turned out that actually it didn't have an impact. It turned out that their official social action campaign had worked better than anything they felt that had emerged organically afterwards. I'm sure that that's not always the case, but it was very interesting to sort of test that. One other interesting finding is that they promoted the Childhood Nutrition uh, Protection Act of, of uh, reviving it. It has to do with the food that's given to kids in schools. And so there was a petition to be signed. And we found that viewership of the film, Food, Inc., didn't in any way increase likelihood that people would sign that petition. And I think it was because their web campaign was so successful. <laughs> they didn't need the film in order to get people to sign the petition. So finding that some of your outcomes didn't necessarily come through because of the film was not necessarily bad news. Yes, anyone else? That was a, an incredibly stimulating talk. Thank you very much for doing that. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, um, remember that P Peter Brand character from Moneyball, Jonah Hill's oh. character? Uh -huh. So do you find that a lot of the people that are doing the, the hardcore number crunching, the propeller heads, for lack of a better term, do you find that um, those people are better suited to the job if they're actually fans of film, if they're studying the film sector? Do you find that they're better at doing their job if they know about movies and they can kind of recall film characters, scripts, narratives, what have you? Or are you looking for people to fill that position that are divorced entirely from films and they're just looking at numbers as a kind of cold, hard, absolute science? Right, well that's a very interesting question because we're very much in the process of staffing, staffing up our media impact project and of course the quant people who are often most qualified to do the trickiest uh, mathematical research that we need to have done, they often don't have backgrounds in media industry and they certainly don't have backgrounds in social impact measurement. So um, that's been an issue because uh, I feel that it's a whole other level of knowledge to understand the culture industry and to understand how film and media work. And I myself have had a very difficult time working with standard survey researchers, say in public health, because we've been working with the Centers for Disease Control for so long. I've worked with a lot of people who have masters in public health who understand how to do public health campaigns and how to uh, evaluate their, um, their effectiveness. Often they know so little about films and about culture and about representation and about aesthetics, that their surveys are just absolutely illegible to me. They make no sense to me at all. And so I felt that I'm coming at it as a cultural studies scholar. I have an English PhD. I did a lot of work in film studies. I can help those people develop a survey instrument that actually uh, is applicable to this kind of work. So I think it's an interesting mix. It actually helps to have people who have fresh eyes, who haven't necessarily worked in the media industry, but you really do need people who have some sort of perspective on this work. 
Any other questions? There's one right here. Uh, the mic is coming. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, you had said you said uh, that you thought this was very inexpensive to do. Uh, so um, let's say I'm a filmmaker and I want to do this with my film. How do I do it inexpensively and effectively? Right. Well, you know, the price point really depends on how many people, uh, you know, have the skill set to do this. We're building up that capacity at, at the Lear Center now. But um, if you were to do through Gallup something like the Food Inc. survey that we did, you would have to seek out a national representative sample. And I'm guessing it would probably cost about a half million dollars. To do something like a propensity score matching survey, which is the technical term for creating those control groups, I'd say it was probably closer to 25K. And we want to make it a lot less than that. And when you do this kind of propensity score matching survey, you're not just getting information about outcomes, you're also gathering a huge amount of information about your audience that can inform your marketing campaign for that film and for many others. So it's an excellent sort of marketing investment as well. Ah, uh, yes, I have to go with the front row. Just a simple one. Of the 20,000 people who responded, what percentage ended up with a propensity for watching Food, Inc.? Oh, how many, how many uh, were you working with in terms of We value? had, in the Food, Inc. survey, we had many, many, a much higher percentage of respondents who had actually seen the film than people who had not seen it. Uh, Food Inc. was just a very, very successful property for participant media, and so it was surprisingly easy for us to find people who had been exposed to the film. Let me tell you, with this kind of media impact research, it's always harder to find people who've been exposed than to find people who haven't seen it yet. So that was uh, truly a blessing, because we were sitting on massive amounts of information, uh, lots of feedback. So what we did when we created the control group is we only used a subset of the people who had actually seen the film, and then the distribution of propensity score scores across each group was exactly the same, duplicated. So there was an equal number of people exposed to people who were unexposed, but in terms of the whole 20,000, a much higher percentage had seen the film. Yeah. Uh, yes. Hi, I have a question about um, assigning what percentage was due to the movie. Um, as a movie, as a filmmaker, you're often encouraged to find as many partners, collaborations, people already working in the same field, doing the same outreach in your topic. And so if you go into these collaborations, like they want to know, is this movie going to create a win-win situation and how much, and you want to know, <laughs> and you're kind of in that catch something something situation <laughs> where both want a piggyback ride. So in these evaluations, you both want to show that you had a substantial uh, contribution to the outcome. How do you assign what the movie did in this? Right, well, what we do as a standard practice even before we started doing this newfangled research is we basically do regression in order to identify which variables are contributing to the outcome opposed to ones that did not contribute. And with Waiting for Superman, we actually did include a series of questions about affiliation with the organizations that the Waiting for Superman Social Action Group had partnered with in their effort to get this out. And so sometimes affiliation affiliation with some of those groups became part of the propensity score model. That if you were affiliated with a particular group, and I can't remember which one actually was statistically significant, that meant it was more likely that you had actually seen the film. But yes, it becomes a very complicated sort of chicken and egg situation. Um, it's probably the most difficult part of putting the survey research together is figuring out what the contributing factors are opposed to what the outcomes are. It's much trickier than, than it may seem. And often uh, using a timestamp.